Hello, this is Ben Parry. I'm the Artistic Director of the National Youth Choirs of Great Britain, and you are listening to the Musicality Podcast. Ever wondered why some people seem to have a gift for music? Have you ever wished that you could play by ear, sing in tune, improvise and jam? You're in the right place. Time to turn those wishes into reality. Welcome to the Musicality Podcast with your host, Christopher Sutton. Hi. This is Christopher, founder of Musical You, and welcome to the Musicality Podcast. Today I'm speaking with Ben Parry, the Artistic Director of the National Youth Choirs of Great Britain. But as you'll be hearing, that's just one of many musical roles he has, including formerly being a singer and arranger with the world-famous a cappella group The Swingle Singers, and directing the London Voices Choir, which has performed on many of the Hollywood film soundtracks that we all know and love. I recently had the pleasure of attending a workshop Ben presented at the London A Cappella Festival, and he had such a great way of getting people of all ability levels quickly singing some quite complex music that I knew we had to invite him onto the show to share his ideas with you. In this conversation, we discuss his own journey from classical church music to cabaret and a cappella, and how it's all informed the way he helps people sing now. We talk about why having a choir get their tuning from a piano can be a really bad idea, and the pros and cons of using intervals versus using scale degrees such as sulfur or note numbers. Ben is clearly a man who has thought deeply about singing in all forms, and he brings his unique experience and perspective to all his roles to the benefit of his singers. I loved having the opportunity to pick his brains, and whatever kind of singer you might be, whether you're a vocal pro or just do karaoke at the pub, or you sing with your local choir or in a barbershop group, or you're only willing to sing in the shower but you wish you could do more, I know you're going to really enjoy this episode. My name is Christopher Sutton, and this is the Musicality Podcast from Musical You. Welcome to the show, Ben. Thank you for joining us today. I'm delighted to talk to you. So you have had an incredible career over the years, a real range of roles and projects and types of music. It was hard for me to know where to start, um, but I suppose one easy option is to start at the beginning. And I'd love to know, you've become this incredible musician and artistic director and um, nurturer of young singers in particular. But what was it like for you growing up? Was music always a part of your life? Was it a late discovery? Did it all come easily? Tell me what that was like. Uh, I'd come from a very musical family. Um, my dad was a, a music teacher and church organist all his life, and my mum was a keen amateur singer. And in fact, I guess I've been surrounded by music ever since birth, actually. Uh, interesting, I'm, I'm asked this question a lot, you know, what was sort of my first musical memories? And, and there are many of them, and there, there are some of them which are really sort of quite pivotal pivotal to my my career or my, my wish to be um, a professional musician. Not least because dad was a, a church organist. I and my three siblings all sang in, in the church choir. This is in Ipswich, um, where I now live. And um, I remember at a very early age, um, I was too young to sing in, in the choir. So, um, so my three siblings were in the choir and I would sit next to dad on, on the organ bench and while he played. One of the most abiding memories was uh, them singing in a, in a choral even song. And this will be for sort of choral even song nerds, if you like. But there's a, a Magnificat Nuctimitis by Stanford, Stanford in C major, um, which starts with a huge great organ chord and the choir come in. And uh, I, I was age four and I turned to my dad and said, oh, daddy, what lovely music. And clearly this had a real it had a real effect on me. Sorry, that is terribly nerdy, isn't it? But <laughs> it's, it's a really it's it's a really important thing, because I think at, at really quite a young age, I realized that music was going to be a massive part of my life. Um, and fast forward a few years, just when I was sort of seven or eight years old, we were very involved with the music of Snape Maltings which is up in Suffolk, where Benjamin Britten lived and worked and ran his wonderful Alborough Festival that still goes on to this day. Um, And mum used to sing in the Alborough Festival Singers. She sang with uh, Benjamin Britten conducting many times. And I remember her coming back from concerts and telling me all about it. Um, And we went to Snape one day um, to this amazing concert hall that Benjamin Britten built. And he he was there and I I met him. Um, A lot of of other... um, 
contemporary uh, colleagues of mine are really sort of quite jealous of the fact that I actually met Benjamin Britten, which was amazing. And I remember him talking and I remember going into the hall and we sang some of his music. It was an opera that he'd written called The Little Sweep. And the audience has these audience songs. And I remember singing this song all about birds singing in the night. And I thought, I want to do this as a, as a, you know, as a grown up. I want to be a musician. So that was really sort of quite pivotal. So music was always around um, in the family. We used to sing. We used to play. We all played instruments. So, yeah, I, I was surrounded by it. Wonderful. And so given that musical beginning, I, I have to jump quickly to one of the, the big questions I wanted to ask you, which relates a bit, I think, to, to your work with the National Youth Choir. Um, given that you were immersed in music from the beginning and you also came from a family who were themselves musical, what's your opinion on talent? You know, if, if someone's going to become an incredible, inspiring musician and composer and arranger like yourself or one of the leading singers in the great choirs of the country, do you think it takes talent? Is it a natural thing or is it more nurture than nature? Well, I was just about to say nurture or nature, and that is one of those things. I mean, uh, if you're surrounded by it, obviously, you know, you're going to uh, engender a sense of, of, of what's around you. But there, there is such a notion as, as a gift, isn't there? There is, you know, talent. It has to be a, a natural thing as well. But that doesn't preclude people from doing it. So if, say, for example, you know, you wanted to sing in a choir, um, but you felt that you hadn't had a background in it. Well, join a choir. You know, it's it's not it's it's as simple as that, actually. And actually, with singing, this this is a big thing. I have constant arguments with my wife, who's a professional violinist, and she will say, you know, the thousands of hours of work that she's had to put into practicing, and she gets so frustrated because singing is such a natural thing. We can all do it. And this notion, I remember my dad talking to me many times about the notion of tone deafness. And actually, he didn't believe that tone deafness existed. Anybody can sing. If anybody can talk, anybody can sing. And in fact, you know, we, we all have voice boxes. So, you know, that, that ability to be able to just um, make that leap from uh, talking to vocalizing to understanding, you know, how, how it works um, is a really interesting thing. Actually, it's just leaning on from that, um, one of my nephews is, is an amazing percussionist, um, and he found it really difficult to sing simply because he hadn't exercised the, these muscles that we have in here. So he talks very quietly, very slowly, and it's all down here. And I had to get, I gave him some exercises on how to sing, and I could I could see it actually. It was a visible thing that he simply didn't know how to use that muscle, and how to hear in his ear how this was working out as an oral um, example of, of, of sound. And it, it, it took, what, five minutes for him to work out? Uh, and it, because I would sing a note like, la, and he would sing, <laughs> and it would, be, it would be well over an octave below. But once he worked out the notion of what was going on in here and how to hear it, we'd we, 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 we beaten it, we'd cracked, we'd cracked the code. And I think it's possible for everybody to do that. Of course, you know, musicians, if you're going to do it at a professional level or at a really high level, then then talent's going to help, isn't it? But it's it's nature and nurture in equal degrees, I would say. That's really interesting to hear. And we've had a lot of that same experience at Musical U with reluctant singers that it, it's partly emotional or psychological and it's partly physical. You know, if someone hasn't moved their voice through their possible pitch range, they simply have no chance of hitting a note. But some very simple exactly. exercises can can give them that freedom. Yeah. So coming back for a minute to your own journey, you were clearly diving into the world of what I would consider kind of classical church music in England growing up. Where did things go from there for you? Uh, I uh, studied music at Cambridge University. I was very lucky. Uh, I, I would say that I was a reluctant student, um, nay, perhaps a bit lazy. Uh, and, I, and I say that simply because I'm not a, I'm not I wouldn't have classed myself as an academic. I'm, I'm, I'd be much more a practical musician. I think if I could go back and do it all again now, I would find it so brilliantly fascinating. But unfortunately, <laughs> I think I'm a bit too old to do that. But um, at university, I, of course, I was I was put together with all these amazing other people who were who were keen musicians. And not just that. The thing about at university in particular for me was that you know you'd be you'd be making music with chemists and lawyers and 
and and scientists and, and all these other people and linguists, which, which again, you know, from a singing point of view, it's amazing. If you've got a singer in a choir who's studying Italian or German or whatever, you know, that that's gold dust really, isn't it? So uh, at university, I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't the model academic student, but um, there I found my love of a whole raft of other things that I hadn't been um, exposed to before. Like you say, I grew up with church music and I grew up with my parents singing and, and there was lots of music in the house. I was a, I was a, not a bad violinist actually. When you, when you, when you line me up with my wife, then I'm hopeless. But I remember turning up to, to, to university. In fact, where, where I met my wife and, um, I thought, yes, I'm going to be a violinist now. Um, and of course there were millions of brilliant, um, instrumentalists. So, uh, so singing was the thing that I then, Got, get, began to get really interested in um, and m- possibly most importantly actually I haven't thought about this for a long time but in my first year I was asked to do um, a cabaret <clears throat> now I'd never really done any light music so here I was singing some sort of cabaret songs and uh, close harmony and I thought wow this 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 is amazing because I'd never done this stuff before um, now the really important part of that was um, a group who some of your listeners, if they're as old as me, might have heard of, which was called Harvey and the Wallbangers. Now, Harvey and the Wallbangers were a group in the 1980s who were ex-Cambridge choral scholars. And they got together and they formed a close harmony group. And then they got really kind of funky and they started learning instruments. And it was a kind of jazz, pop, rock and roll combo. And a friend of mine who was at university said, you've got to come and hear this group Harvey and the Wallbangers. And I went to this theatre and sat down and this thing started and it was close harmony. It was rock and roll. And I thought I died and gone to heaven. This was just amazing. And I thought this is the sort of music that I want to get into. Years later, we're fast forwarding a huge amount, actually a couple of the group, Chris Purvis, who's now a, a major opera singer, and Harvey Braff, who started the group, a uh, brilliant composer, are very good friends of mine. And I wouldn't have imagined in a million years that those guys would have been friends. I worshipped them from afar in the, in the audience while they were on stage. So, you know, that whole kind of melting pot of being at university, meeting different people and different musical styles was something that was very, very important to me. Mm. And it's funny, we, we had kind of the same choral blend as it were in that I grew up in a chapel choir singing a lot in my school days and went on to barbershop and acapella and really loved that and I found it stretched me in a very different way as a singer and one of the things I was excited to talk to you about was just how you found it transitioning from that world of classical choral music that can be quite formal and precise to acapella which is precise in its own way you know it's precise in a very expressive stylistic way um, and yep. obviously a cappella can be any genre, anything from classical to jazz to pop to rock to anything you imagine. So how did you develop as a singer through exploring that different direction? That's a really interesting thing to talk about, because basically, you know, one informs the other and vice versa. I mean, I what I do now was very much sort of akin to what I was doing at university. So one day I'd be singing in King's Choir and singing Even Song and just getting off on the fact that I was in this amazingly beautiful building singing the most fantastic music. The next day I'd be writing a, a, a music essay on, I don't know, um, uh, Mahler symphonies or whatever and listening to Mahler's Ninth Symphony. Um, in fact, a friend of mine had to listen to it on 45, you know, when we used to have records, he ran out of time and he went to the library and he had to listen to it on 45 instead of 33 to try and get through it all. Um, and then the next day I'd be doing a, a cabaret and singing um, jazz songs or, or, you know, singing in a close harmony group. It's basically what I do now, actually, is, you know, from one day to the other, I have this, for me, I'm so lucky because I have this um, interesting eclectic career where I'll be where I'll be touching on all these different sorts of music. But like you say, you know, the discipline that is required to sing in a, in a choir like King's College Choir is obviously going to inform you in a way you might uh, rehearse a, an a cappella piece. You know, the kind of uh, all the attributes that are there, the style, the blend, the precision, um, the way that you rehearse it, the tuning. Um, listening out for different parts, how how the balance might work, and all those sorts of things. So, so I, I, I've been blessed that I've been able to to have that in as a student, but then that's informed totally the way I work as as a professional musician as well. 
And on paper, my impression is your career kind of went deep into the acapella world with your um, time with the Swingle Singers before circling back into that world of choral music. And yeah. Is that right? Yeah, very much so. Um, I mean, uh, the year after I left university, so I was doing some cabaret um, as, a, as a sort of young freelancer and earning absolutely no money whatsoever. Uh, and then uh, the, a job came up in, in the Swingle Singers. Um, and uh, I thought this was something that I should be throwing my hat into the ring for. I was only 22, but I did get the job. They were really mean to me, actually. <laughs> you know, they gave me five auditions, which was just, they kept bringing me back and saying, well, can you sing this song? And can you sing that song in a particular style? And in the end, I think, which is sort of quite unlike me, because I'm sort of quite unconfrontational, unconfront but I said to them, actually, can you just stop doing this? And if you want me to do the job, just give it to me. Or if not, just <laughs> tell me to leave. But I did get it. And I, I spent five brilliant years in in the swingles um interestingly and ironically the one thing i didn't really enjoy was was touring and being away from home and i have to say probably nine ten months of the year we were away from home but it was again a, a, a amazing kind of training ground for me even though i was doing it professionally you know from the likes of uh, arranging for a part acapella group um doing uh, some albums um, recording techniques producing um, uh, rehearsing, um, um, arranging a piece of music and then rehearsing it with the, with the group. So you had to be the leader. And it, it, I really cut my teeth on how one does that in a, in a very effective, proactive way. Having said that, during that time I was in the Swingles, I still actually was in a, I was singing church music because I had a job at the Tower of London. Um, they have a brilliant choir there in the, in the chapel within the tower. And this was in the days when you could actually drive your car right into the into the Tower of London. You could park outside the chapel. You can't do that anymore. Um, so I kept that job open. And so if there was a Sunday where I was free, I would I would go and sing some wonderful church music. I mean, church music has been, you know, the love of my life for for as long as I can remember, you know, back in the days when Stanford and C and sitting on my dad's um, stool on the, on, the, on the organ, you know. Um, so I've always shared that love. Uh, in tandem with everything else that I do. But yeah, it was a really interesting five years of, of real total discipline and understanding of, of that particular art. Yeah, it sounds like it could be a real trial by fire. You know, we come back again and again on this show to the importance of your ear and your brain's awareness of music as being critical yeah. to everything you do in music. And, you know, to go so quickly to being part of one of the top groups in the world of all time in a cappella music and not only performing but arranging and composing that must have really pushed you to your limit in terms of your oral understanding of music yeah i think i think possibly you know there's a degree of of just thinking well that's i, I that's what i did that's what that's what i'm good at mm -hmm. <laughs> it's difficult as a sometimes as a musician to say actually oh, i'm quite good at that um <laughs> Um, but I think I think that's where my where my where my metier was, you know, that uh, and it, I was given the opportunity to do that. It was an interesting time actually to join the group because they'd they hadn't sort of really made their mark, uh, particularly in the UK, and the the American market had dried up, and so we were sort of slightly at a low ebb, and we took it upon ourselves to pay for a flight out to New York and do a showcase in New York um, for Columbia artists who were massive concert agency and we set our stall up basically the eight of us we were we were all quite young you know and we thought right okay this is an opportunity for us and we did exactly that we thought right what are we good at let's show the americans what we're good at and we put together a, i think it was a 20 minute half hour little showcase of our best arrangements we rehearsed it and rehearsed it we flew ourselves out to new york put ourselves up in a cheap hotel, went and did the showcase. And that really was the making of the group from the time I was in it, because Columbia artists thought we were the best thing ever since sliced bread. And from that, we then toured the States four times a year regularly, doing 20, 30 concerts. I mean, we were there four or five weeks at a time. Um, absolutely saved our bacon. And from that, we then uh, increased our repertoire massively, of course. Um, but we then got a recording contract with Virgin Classics and, and, and on it went. So, you know, that was, that was a really good time for me. But it was it was interesting being part of that. So um, actually taking it upon ourselves to be proactive as a musician. And like you're saying, 
you know, just that whole idea of of rehearsing and really listening to each other and understanding how how our voices were going to work the most effectively as as an eight part a cappella group. Often, you know, we'd 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 rehearse or record something, um, and we just did it intuitively because we worked together so much. Um, we were just naturals at, at tuning. You, you know, you, I, I remember a bit, there was, a, we were a bit, we were singing in unison and two of the altos had to sing sort of the same note at one point and one sang a bit sharp and one sang a bit flat and the two of them within a split second, there's a recording of it. It's a bit of Debussy that they sang and they sang this note and within about a nanosecond, they'd each uh, found the tuning exactly because they were both wrong and they, they righted themselves within less than a second it was extraordinary and i thought wow you know that's that's real kind of oral discipline and something that only comes obviously with really hard work and a lot of regular singing but it's something that you know if you join a choir i mean i find this with choirs that i work with all over the place you know if they do that regular thing of singing week after week you're going to get better individually but also as as a team and that's one of the joys of singing in a choir isn't it Mm, absolutely and I love that you highlighted that because that, to me, you know, I, I sang barbershop and acapella to an amateur level, but it, yeah. one of the abiding memories is how unique that situation is. You know, you can sing as a soloist, you can sing in a choir as part of a large number, but it's only really a cappella where you're one of maybe four people and you can all look each other in the eye and you can be mm-hmm. so in the moment, all performing with the same instrument, essentially. And it requires so much of you to be present and react to one another in a way that I think performing in an instrument ensemble or a large choir, just it does, it's not quite the same. We did we did that little exercise at the end of the workshop where I I met you the other day where we were tuning. Mm. This is something that I, I I I've really become interested in this this whole idea of what's called just intonation. And so if you play the piano, um, it's it a piano is tuned at what's called equal temperament. So the the distance between every single note is the same. Now if you play a chord, we're quite used to hearing it nowadays. And you play a chord on the piano, you go, oh yeah, that's a nice chord. Well, actually, it's not in tune because it's false to have the gap between each semitone exactly the same. It means that if you play a certain interval, and if we're talking about a third, so you go one, three, on a, on a, on a piano, if it's tuned, and I think I talked about this in the workshop, actually the third is always really sharp, one, three, and everybody kind of likes sharp thirds because they sound really good. It's only because our ears have been tuned to what's called equal temperament. Actually, if you sing in a choir and you tune a chord and actually you make the, 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 the third lower than it would be on a piano and the fifth, one, five, nice and bright, which on an equal temperament piano is flat, um, the chord sounds much more in tune. It's, it's got the natural harmonics within it. And that, to me, is something really interesting. And I think what you were talking about just then with, with singing an a cappella group, particularly when you've got one part per voice, spending a lot of time doing that sort of thing can be really, really rewarding. We're so used to hearing equal temperament. The, the piano is my is my is my least favorite instrument. <laughs> no, it's not. But do, do you know what I mean? When it comes to tuning, I think that's really, really important thing. And particularly when you you can do it in choirs as well. We do it with the National Youth Choir all the time. And in fact, in my choir at King's College, the mixed choir that sings on Mondays, even though we have very limited rehearsal time, we often just balance and tune some chords. So we'll sit on a chord. We'll take the people who are out singing the key note, like if it's in C major, people singing C, just make sure that's in tune. Then we'll put a nice bright G in, which is the fifth, and then we'll have a nice centered third. And you can really tell the difference. And I, I don't think there are many choirs who spend so much time doing that, but I would encourage all choral conductors to work much harder at that because I think that's, that's, that's a whole minefield of wonderful stuff we can research. Yeah, what a, a beautiful example of how you've drawn on your a cappella experience to inform how you direct yeah, choirs. Absolutely. Now. Because I, like yeah. you say, we take for granted that the piano is the correct answer. You know, you, you play the piano chord, that's what yeah. you're aiming for. But of course, if you're just four people in a room and it's up to you to make the major chord, you find the tuning, you trust your ear and you adjust as needed. Yeah. Uh, there's one professional choir who shall remain nameless, who I guess conducted and they were they were we were rehearsing a piece and the pianist was playing along and you know just helping them to find the notes and i asked him to stop playing actually and the choir were really offended that i'd 
They said, well, we, you know, but we're, we're sight reading this. And I said, well, yeah, you're a professional choir. Come on, sight read it. And don't, don't rely on the piano. Um, it's, actually, it's actually one thing that's really, really interesting, a real interesting exercise. And of course, we didn't, in that workshop where I met you, we didn't use any piano. You know, we just did it all with the voices. And I think that's a really good discipline for, for some choirs. Actually, just part the piano, put, close the lid, just get on with the singing. Listen and, and, and hear what's going on and use your voices to create the sound rather than relying on not only the tuning of the piano, but of course, it's also it's the percussive effect. So the, the chord goes down and you hear it and you go, oh, that's where we need to sing. Actually, if you watch the conductor or you or you watch each other, you should be able to internalize the rhythm as well. We're getting deep. We keep getting deep into the semantics of, of my approach to, to choral direction. I hope so. Um, <laughs> you, you mentioned sight reading there, and that's something else that I think causes a lot of people angst when it comes to singing, and particularly, you know, singing in a church choir where you might be handed a thick wad of um, a manuscript paper and <laughs> expected to somehow magic up the notes. And, you know, at Musical U, we focus a lot on relative pitch and helping people understand the relationship between the notes in the scale. And you had a, a really elegant exercise at that workshop, which I, I say elegant because I think it's something you can explain in a few moments, but someone can go away and practice every day and develop a really valuable skill with. And I was wondering if you could just share that, the, the singing of scale degree numbers and then starting to take them out sure. and remix them in different combinations. Yeah, absolutely. And before I do that, I should say that, that when I was really young, um, my dad uh, tried to teach me the piano. Um, he, he failed dismally, like all parents do, trying to teach their children instruments. Um, but he, he, he started me at an early age, around about five, and I did everything by ear. So I can still, I can still play by ear, um, uh, at, at, but I could not sight read um, when I was five. And my dad didn't realize this. He started the first few weeks and he'd say, right, let's, here's a little tune written down. Right. Would you like to play that to me? And I go, well, you play it to me first and then I'll and then I'll, I'll do it. And he literally played me the, the tune or the piece and I would play it back. No, perfect. But I was doing it by ear. I wasn't reading the music. Um, and he after a few weeks, he cottoned on and he said, no, you do it first. And I said, well, I, I can't I can't read it. And he used to make me, this is really horrible, and I love my dad dearly, but he, he used to play piano duets with me where I'd have to keep going. And he said, come on, keep going, keep going. And I, I remember being in tears. So, you know, I, I could not sight read and I had to learn how to do that because my ear was, was, was very keen and I could, I just pick things up all the time. Um, I'm still not the greatest sight reader on the, on the piano. I can sight read, um, sight, I can sight sing really well. Um, and it's and it's an easy thing to pick up. I mean, obviously, there's the whole soul fast system, which is fantastic. It's not something I've ever done. So I've never used it, although I do understand how it works. But what we have done, uh, I've picked this up more recently with the National Youth Choir is using the number system. Um, so you, you take your your dough, if you like, your one, and you use that and you can tune and you can think about degrees of the scale very easily in whatever key it might be. So if one is there, and you can literally do a little pattern, just going one, two, one, three, two, one, four, three, two, one. You can carry on going five, four, three, two, one, but you can actually go five, six, seven, one, six, seven, one, seven, one, one, one. Then if you want to do a little exercise, which I think we did, take out three and go one, two, one, clap on three, two, one. Then you've got to find four, four, two, one, perhaps five is a click, four, two, one, six, and you're taking out various notes. You've got to find where four is, but you always relate it to one. And that's basically what I do if I'm reading as well. So you're sight reading, you know where C is. If you can understand that, so C is the one that hangs down below the line and it's got a, it's got a ledger line through it. If that's middle C, that's always going to be your one. So you can work out where three or six or four or seven and two. It, it's, it's really as simple as that. And if you change key and suddenly G becomes one, then A is going to be two and B is going to be three and so on. So that, that little exercise, I think, is really helpful. The other thing that we did was just call out four numbers between one and seven. So you go one, five, seven, two, and you've just got to work out one, five, seven, two, or whatever else. And just give yourself those little exercises and you'll very, very quickly attune to where those are, where you are in the degree of the scale. 
Fantastic. Well, for any of our... Lesson lesson over. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a beautiful lesson. It's something that I think any listeners can start to experiment with, you know, even if you just start with one, two, and three, um, whether sure, you've ever absolutely. sung before or not, you probably know the sound of one, two, three, two, one, just play around with three that for a day. Mice. Yeah, mm, yeah, three exactly. blind mice, exactly. Um, we'll go one, three, two, or two, three, one, or three, one, two, you, you just, you know, combination locks. Mm-hmm. That, that's all it is. Unlock them. Absolutely. And it's... It's the kind of instinctive understanding of the scale that I so wish someone had explained to me when I was growing up singing, because I was immersed in singing all day, every day, trying to sight read from sheet music using intervals and using reference songs. And it was such hard intellectual work trying to figure out what the music should sound like from the sheet. I'd love to talk. I'd love to talk to you about intervals because intervals is a really interesting thing because yes, intervals are useful if you want to read from music, but there's there, there's a slight misnomer I feel um, uh, about trying to w- work out what intervals are. So you go one one two three four five one, one that, that that must be a fifth, and trying to count it up. Now it is a way of doing it. I'm not saying it's wrong. I I'm very much of the opinion, and we talk we've been talking about you know our oral perception that actually. Uh, intervals and interval recognition um, is much easier if you can use sonic recall. I once had the most fascinating conversation with someone who was writing a film script about a child who had sonic recall. Now, this wasn't a musician. It was it was something else. It was a spy film or something. I don't know, some crazy stuff. But he'd heard that I, I went on about sonic recall a lot. And I and I had this a chat with this guy who was writing this fascinating script and he he understood where I was coming from with this because of course all intervals sound the same. Now the one that you can really hear is the minor second, the semitone. So if you play those together, you can hear the beats. It goes like that. If you play a major second, you can almost hear them. It goes really fast because there obviously there's a there's a there's a, a, a wave sign that's going really fast and you can actually hear it. But if you can work out, stay with me, go with me on this, is if if you can work out what a fifth sounds like, not the two notes separately, but actually what the actual sound of a, of an interval is, um, then you're, it, it's easy. So you could actually do worse than that to actually sit at uh, our, our dear friend, the piano, and play major thirds and go, oh, that's what a major third sounds like. And sometimes, of course, um, the famous French composer Messiaen, believed that all music was just colors so you could you could assign yourself a color if you thought that a major third sounded you know yellow then then that's yellow it's going to sound the same wherever you play it or whether wherever two people sing it if you thought that a, a perfect fifth a note two notes five notes apart sound, sounded gray then then listen to grays all, all the time you know major six minor six and all those sorts of things i think that's really helpful um and i i I would maintain that that that's a a, an even better way than counting up intervals i hope that that kind of makes sense it's always been something that i've really latched onto because that's how my and that's how my three children um uh if you play them intervals they'll just go yeah that's a major six because they they know they know the color of it they know the sound of it they're recalling the sound Mm. we've definitely seen that with our members at musical you going between what we would call the melodic form where it's one note and then the other note and the harmonic form where it's both notes together um can definitely help people tune in you know if you get the sound of that blend of the two notes into your ear um it becomes much easier when you hear them i I think absolutely for us the the limiting factor in intervals just tends to be putting them to use you know naming them in isolation is one thing and you can get very good at that but we found people really then have a gulf when it comes to using them to play by ear or recognize chords it takes a lot of work to bridge that gap of course it does and yeah absolutely I, I, for us with our members anyway it just seems like the sulfur approach or numbering the scale degrees like we've been talking about it gives you a much faster route to understanding absolutely. the the melodies yep. and the chords but I think I think the sonic recall leads on from that. Mm. You see. So when once you've learned what where a third is, then if you start playing thirds, you go, oh yeah, no, that 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 sounds the same as that third. Right. 
it, it's all it's always going to. Um, but no, absolutely, I agree that the numbering system and all the so far is is definitely the first approach to that. Mm. So you're one of those fascinating music educators who has the kind of top level experience in terms of expertise mm. and you know being a world leading performer but actually works with some of the most beginner stage musicians. You know, you work with the National Youth Choirs of Great Britain. Obviously, those are very high-level choirs, but you're taking very young singers who don't have that expertise or experience yet. I'd love to hear how you, how you approach that. You know, what's your attitude when you're directing one of these choirs and welcoming new singers in? Do you find it's a challenge to get them up to scratch? Do you have particular approaches you use to, to bring them into the choral setting rapidly? Or? Well, that's really interesting because one of the things we haven't mentioned are the uh, choral courses, that one, one of which I run in the summer. These are, these are run by, they're, they're, they're called the Eton Choral Courses simply because they were founded by Ralph Allwood, who, who was the director of music at Eton College. Um, there are five courses each year. And the interesting thing about these courses are, in the past, they were ostensibly designed to, to um, offer experience to people who wanted to do choral scholarships, and particularly at Cambridge and Oxford. Now, we know, of course, the landscape with choral singing has changed completely now uh, in, a, in a very, very positive way. Um, and... Um, so what we're finding now with the with the Eton Choral Courses is that, you know, we have a much broader range of abilities and people, young people wanting to go into different areas. So, you know, there'll be other universities, there'll be some who don't necessarily want to go to university. They might want to go to music conservatoire. They might to go might to, want to go on and do some um, vocational training or whatever, but they share a love of singing. Um, the fascinating thing about the Eton Choral Courses is that they are unauditioned. So a group of 50 young singers between the ages of 16 and 18 will turn up never having sung together before. And our challenge is that by the end of the week, they're going to be doing a concert or an even song in somewhere like Eton College Chapel or King's College Chapel, Cambridge or St. Paul's Cathedral. And some of them do actually a live broadcast even song on BBC Radio 3. It's got to be that good. And so their trajectory it's fascinating to to watch over the years. This is actually this year is the twentieth year I've been I've been directing courses, and watching that trajectory from a young group of singers who who start there, and there are some who've actually never sung in a choir. They've been signed up by their school because they love their singing, and they may have had some singing lessons, but they've never sung in a in a in a chapel choir, if you like. Um, and getting them to sing Anglican psalms to the to the degree where they do it live on Radio Three is is, is some challenge, I can tell you. But you know, in, in, invariably they 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 go with the flow, and because they are their minds are so open to adaptation and development and inquiry, there's a wonderful sense of cohesion as you go through the week. I mean, they do get terribly tired. I remember the first time I did it, first couple of years by about day five of, a, of an eight day course and they were on their knees and I thought, Oh no, you know, they've lost interest. Come on, <laughs> stay with me. But I realized it was just that they were tired and they, they, they were loving it, but you know, their level of concentration was, was waning through fatigue. Um, then as we know with all young singers, you know, they pull it out of the bag at the last minute as well. So there's an element of that, but just going back to what you were saying about, you know, working with, with people who are at the very beginnings of their, of their of their journey with, with music that that's a challenge as well that's where you know the workshopping for me has been so interesting because you know there, there are no barriers there you know you're standing there's no piano there's no music stand there's no music um there's no sense of uh, a language barrier you know we're doing exercises that don't require that we sang some african chants you know where you just learn the the syllables you don't you you know it's not a language that we speak so there's 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 no there's no barrier there either um, and particularly the, I think the round that we did, we, we did a six part round and suddenly you're singing in six part harmony, but actually you've only just learned one tune by ear and suddenly you're creating six part harmony, I think is, is a really interesting way of just engendering a, a, an enthusiasm and a, and a response from, from young people. I remember doing a, a, a workshop years ago in, in Scotland where I used to live in Edinburgh and I'd chosen this song. It was a, it was a Christmas concert and it was with primary children. And it was in it was in five five eight, and it's kind of went Christmas time is party time, but 
And I thought, oh no, why have I chosen something that's in five eight? You know, it'd be much easier to go one, two, three, four. This kid, these kids have obviously had no perception of what five eight was. It didn't matter, and they just did it completely naturally. They just understood the the the, the rhythm of the words, and they just latched onto it straight away. And I remember coming out of that thinking, oh my god, you know, that would that would test some professional adult choirs. But but for the young kids, you know, they they are amazingly adaptable and malleable in their in their approach to to their music making so we needn't be frightened of that fascinating why is there not a contradiction there you know you have studied classical choral music in the very rigid formal traditional sense where there is a way of doing things step by step people are taught very carefully and perform very in a very polished way and yeah. at the same time, you're talking about, you know, any group of 50 people coming into a room and performing six part harmony. You're talking about a group of young singers coming together for a week and performing on Radio 3. But how is there no contradiction there? How have you managed to reconcile those two, the very careful, structured, traditional approach to singing and teaching singing and this much more inclusive, encouraging and effective way of getting a group of people singing together? Simple answer. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I've always, uh, I've always latched onto that notion, and I mentioned it earlier about one informing the other. Um, you, the, this whole thing of, of, you know, the discipline of singing in a professional choir or conducting a professional choir, um, informing the way I might work with a bunch of young primary children. Um, and I've, I've I've talked about this before, actually, where, you know, sometimes it surprises me. I'll be, I could be doing uh, so with my London Voices Choir, which is a, a group of professional singers who is mainly a recording choir. So we do a lot of film soundtracks and you will have heard London Voices. You know, anybody who's interested in film will invariably have heard London Voices doing singing on film. So, you know, I mean, the likes of Harry Potter and The Hobbit and even the latest Bond film, you know, we were singing on that. There you have the, 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 the sheer discipline of being in a recording studio in London, the light going on, there is no rehearsal, there's sight reading and it's got to be perfect the first time. Um, to the, the opposite end where, like we say, you know, you've got a group of, of primary kids who just want to come in because their teachers told them and you've got to infuse them for 40 minutes and they come out absolutely buzzing. Both groups come out buzzing. That's great. And sometimes I'm really interested by that notion of sometimes you'll get a better sense of application from the young singers than you would from the from the the professional singers because they do it as a job, some of them. And then sometimes, you know, you'll get the more enthusiastic approach from the professional singers rather than the kids. It kind of topsy turvy. And that's what fascinates me with the with the work that I do, because there are always those challenges. It's, it's never it's never the same uh, one day to the next. Um, and I guess, like you say, it is a bit of a contradiction because, you know, how can you how can you stack up um, singing an African chant with with a bunch of school children to, to singing um, choral even song in King's College, Cambridge? Well, they do. They do because because singing in a way is just it's just a natural thing. It's part of us. Um, always has been for thousands and thousands of years. And in, in that sense, you know, I think that's that's a really wonderful thing that it, it's actually, you know, one sharing the other, I, I think. Um, for me personally, I, I don't I don't know why I haven't really sort of reconciled within myself why I, I, I do the, the both and, and the, the two inform the other. But but hey, I'm lucky, I guess. <laughs> as long as I do, I, I think the thing is with, with, a, with a, being a musician, one of the most important things is, you know, a lot of people say as an actor, you know, oh, well, it's down to luck and who you know. Well, yeah, okay, it might be, but there's also um, having a natural talent. There's also being in the right place at the right time. There's also doing a very good job and making people feel good about themselves. So when you turn up, I remember asking a Hollywood composer this once, one of the soundtracks we were doing. I said, you know, how do you end up writing for Harry Potter when it used to be John Williams? And he said, well, it's because I do a really good job. <laughs> and people can rely people can rely on that composer to, to deliver the goods. And I think as musicians, you know, whether we're amateur or, or professional, that's the thing. You know, you've got to engender a sense of enjoyment and inclusivity and understanding and empathy, particularly if you're singing in a choir. Soloist is a different thing. 
But if you're singing in a choir, if you're playing in an orchestra, you know, have an understanding with your fellow musicians and just find that sense of enjoyment as well, because enjoyment has to be part of it. Fantastic. Well, I had a final question, which was, how can listeners know if they are good enough to go and join a choir? But I feel like it's it's somewhat redundant to ask it, given our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I think anybody's good enough. And I mean, of course, the thing is that, that singing is, it's, it's always been a cool thing to sing, but it's, it, it it's become increasingly cool with the with the likes of uh, you know the, the TV series and the things that happen on the radio and the a cappella competitions and and choirs office choirs you know what a brilliant thing that is as well um, so there are opportunities there for for anybody at whatever level I mean just a really sobering thought was a was a conference I went to the other day where I heard about the choir with no name which is the choir for homeless people. Um, and, you know, the, we had a presentation from the, the woman who runs the organization. and She was saying, you know, that in any one night there are 3000 homeless people on the streets of London. That's just in London. I mean, and then you've got Birmingham and Liverpool and all these other places. You know, there may be they don't know, but there may be, you know, up to two million people homeless. But they've got this thing called the choir with no name. I would urge your listeners to go and look them up on, on online. Um, and it was so sobering and empowering and thought provoking that, you know, here are people who are at the rock bottom uh, with, with life in general, you know, whether, whether through money problems, family problems, mental problems, but the choir with no name, they don't, they don't purport to be able to put people back um, off the streets and, and get them into, into, into work and all those sorts of things. It, it, it's just an empowering thing that people come to sing together. And that's all, all it's about. Some people actually, they say they have the success of them actually turning up to the rehearsal, whether or not they sing. You know, that is a challenge in themselves. Um, when they do sing and they showed this video of these people and they were saying, you know, this is the highlight of my week. You know, this is the thing which which makes me feel happiest. And they sing together. They're given a hot meal and they talk to each other. And there's that sharing of just this love of, of singing. And that we kind of all sat back on our chairs and went, wow. You know, there, there, but the grace of God go I. It was extraordinary. So yeah, I, would, I just mentioned that because the, at any level, you can find the opportunity to make music together. And we all know how good music um, is for us and the making of it and how, how it stimulates our brains. So, yeah, there's, there's, there's opportunity for everyone there, and particularly with singing because you, the instrument's within you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ben, for joining us on the show today. Not at all. The Musicality Podcast is brought to you by Musical U. Learn more at musical-u.com. I spent a lot of time in the world of church music growing up, and in my experience there are two types of educators there. Most are very formal and traditional, and can make you feel quite intimidated and nervous about trying to sing this kind of music. The other type is surprisingly down-to-earth, encouraging and supportive, while still having that total expertise and enabling you to develop that expertise yourself. I think you'll agree with me that Ben is definitely in the latter camp. So I was really keen to hear his thoughts on what had helped him become the musician and educator that he is now, and his perspective on how to reconcile these two worlds of excellence and accessibility. Ben grew up immersed in church music, with two musician parents and plenty of choral singing. Even at the age of four, he knew that music would be a big part of his life. I asked Ben early in the conversation, and it really came through in what he said later too, that he believes that success in music is a combination of nature and nurture. Whether it's the child of two musicians being raised with plenty of music education too, or it's the interplay of him directing a professional choir for film soundtracks one day and an assorted group of total beginners the next day, he's found that there's no contradiction between the discipline, experience and precision needed for singing at the highest levels and the absolute accessibility of singing to anyone who has a voice. Ben studied music through university and found an unexpected interest in more popular styles of music, going on to audition and land a place in the Swingle Singers and spending five years touring and arranging for the group. We talked about the unique requirements of a cappella singing, and how it gives you a perspective on tuning, blend, and collaboration that you just don't get in an instrumental group or a large choir. 
Ben has clearly brought those insights into his work with choirs of all sizes and styles, and I loved hearing his explanations, including why piano is just not a helpful instrument for choirs to tune to. One topic we've covered on the podcast a few times is solfa, the do-re-mi system of naming scale degrees. It was great to hear Ben's opinion on this. He uses numbers instead of names, but essentially is teaching his singers the same system. Try out the exercise he recommended of singing up the scale in numbers, and then moving between the notes in different orders, and then clapping or snapping your fingers in place of certain notes. This is a fantastic and easy way to start training your ears and your voice to understand the notes of the scale, and that has an immediate impact on your ability to sight-sing from written music or to play music by ear. It's rare and wonderful for a musician who has performed and taught at the highest levels to still have such enthusiasm for helping people take their first steps. Ben gave three great examples, which should inspire anyone considering learning to sing or join a choir. With the Eton Choral Courses, he takes a group of aspiring singers of all ability levels who've never sung together before, and in the space of just a week, he has them singing at a standard that's ready for BBC radio broadcast. In his workshops, he's frequently encountering a group of people of very mixed ability levels, and as I experienced myself, he's found it can be easy and natural to get them singing some even quite complex music together in just a short session. And finally, he mentioned the wonderful Choir With No Name project, which provides a singing opportunity to homeless people around the UK and demonstrates how simple yet powerful the act of singing can be for each of us. I'm sure you'll be interested to know more about Ben and his various projects, and you can head to benparry.net for his personal website. And we'll have links to the King's College Choir of Cambridge and the National Youth Choirs of Great Britain in the show notes for this episode at musicalitypodcast.com so that you can learn more about those choirs and the concert dates they have coming up. Thanks for listening to this episode. Stay tuned for our next one, where we'll be talking about that challenging yet learnable skill mentioned in this episode of sight-reading music from a written score. Thank you for listening to the Musicality Podcast. This episode has ended, but your musical journey continues. Head over to musicalitypodcast.com where you will find the links and resources mentioned in this episode, as well as bonus content exclusive for podcast listeners.